Good afternoon, everyone. Um, glad to see so many people here, both in person and online as well. I'm Wayne Giles. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health, and I am chairing the search um, for the Vice Chancellor for a research position, along with Pete Nelson, uh, Dean of the College of Engineering. Um, I, uh, so uh, we have today uh, Dr. Steve Goddard, um, who is the Interim Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development, and the John Olson Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, he got his uh, BA degree from the University of Minnesota Duluth and his postdoctorate degree at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, he's going to talk for about 30 minutes, um, and then we'll open things up for question and answer. I do want to remind everyone that um, after the session, if you could go in and fill out, um, go on the website and fill out evaluations, that would be helpful for all of us as well. So I'll turn things over to Dr. Goddard. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Is this on? Are we? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, on that evaluation, I've mod I'm a professor of computer science and engineering. I've modified it so that it says outstanding in every category. So just just submit it on, on my behalf for me. Uh, uh, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be here, and uh, I've had a wonderful time so far. Um, the questions have been tough but pretty fair, and we'll try and go with that. So. Uh, I was uh, asked to speak for, uh, I guess, 30 minutes now. Wayne's starting to make up the rules on me, change them as we go. Um, I'm going to try and stick with that. I, I want to make sure that we have time to answer your questions, because I think that's the most important part. I'm just here to lay a framework. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on uh, all the groups I've talked with so far today. I can, go, I can spend hours talking about any one of these topics, and I get really excited about it. So I might try and do that. But I'm going to contain it to fit all of these things in the time we have. So I'm going to do this about three parts, and hopefully about 10 minutes on each part, probably. A little bit of, you know, why am I here? Right? What, what's my interest here? Where am I coming from? Uh, where are we, and what's ahead? And, and when I mean we, I mean UIC, and what's ahead? One of the things I do is I quickly, I, I'm all in on things I do. And so I'm, it's easier for me to say we and us than you and UIC. Um, so I'm going to switch that vocabulary right away to talk about us, okay? And, and how do we get there? And one of the things I do a lot is I ask questions. And I, don't, I don't have all the answers, but I ask questions and I find when we ask the questions and we do as a community, we come up with really good answers. And so that's the way I've phrased a number of this. So, so a little bit of background, my education. Uh, we talked a little bit about my, my uh, education. Uh, what I want to point out with that most of this doesn't really matter, probably, right? I, I've got the prerequisite background. But I want to point out I have a Bachelor of Arts degree. Yeah, that's unusual. I'm a computer engineer. My tenure home's in the College of Engineering, and I have a Bachelor of Arts degree. Why do I have a Bachelor of Arts degree? Because when I, st I wanted to have, be a major in computer science, and the, uh, at Duluth, they didn't offer a BS in computer science. And it turned out I wanted a double major, and so I could get a BA in both. Uh, I met the requirements for a BS in mathematics, but I mean, meant I had to stay another year of just total credit hours, didn't matter what it was, to get both a BA and a BS. I said, no way, I'm going to BA. But that was a tremendous experience. So I have nearly a, a, a close to a minor, actually, in ancient civilizations. I just, I took, I really found that fascinating. So it gave me a well-rounded experience. Why Duluth? And this is important, that I, I grew up in Minnesota. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. And if you talk to me for 10 minutes, you'll find that out. Um, so I'm used to the cold weather. I'm excited about it. it it's great. Duluth, I, I, was lived, I grew up halfway between Minneapolis and Duluth. And my plan, I'm a first generation college student, so uh, my parents, my mother was the first one to graduate from high school in either side of my family. But education was always critical in my family. In my, it was never a question whether I was going to go to college. In fact, I was going to go to college and I was going to become a lawyer, according to my, my parents. So I think I let them down. I didn't go to law school. Sorry, Susan, but it just wasn't in my, my plan. Uh, so, uh, but I was going to go to Minneapolis and about, I think it was May, March after the state uh, high school wrestling tournament, the wrestling coach came and asked me to go to Duluth. And so I was a student athlete at Duluth. And I lettered in, in wrestling. I was a varsity uh, letter winner at, at, at Duluth. And my plan was to spend two years in Duluth, and then I'd go down to Minneapolis and get my real degree. I had a tremendous experience. It was a great education. I stayed. I loved it. Um, and then I went to work right away. 
and eventually I, I got my PhD and things at North Carolina. Uh, but I went to work right out of uh, college because I was tired of being poor. I wanted to, to start making some money, and that was why I went to college, you know, was, was that whole point. So I worked in the computer industry for 13 years, a lot of Department of Defense activity. Four years, I went to work for a company called, uh, it was originally Sperry, then Unisys. Uh, I, part of that, I spent a year and a half at Bell Laboratories working as an as a on-site integrator. I had designed an operating system for an embedded signal processor system that was a second generation standard system. I can go into that. It doesn't really matter. I was doing that kind of activity. Three months before I got married, I decided, I had this brilliant idea, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm gonna start my own company. And my fiance was uh, supportive of that. Um, I had met her uh, four years earlier as we were both math majors and we, we studied math as an undergraduate. Took me, took me four years to convince her to marry me, but eventually I did. So she backed me up, we were gonna start this company and, and that worked out really well. I did that for nine years. Along the way, we went up in North Carolina, Research Triangle Park area. Um, really enjoyed doing that. Wanted to get my PhD, uh, so uh, I, I did that. And then my plan was to stay with my company. It was, we always kept it small, no more than five employees. Fairly small company. I really enjoyed doing the work with that. And, but I found I enjoyed working with students. It was a requirement when I was doing my PhD that we had to teach a class. I tried to get out of it. I, I tried my best. I've taught classes in industry. I did stuff for the Naval Research Labs and all this stuff. No, you gotta, you gotta teach. So I did and I thought, well, this is kind of cool. It's hard, but I like it. So I f decided I would uh, go, to, go to the academy and uh, drop the mic moment. And so uh, I found that uh, um, when as I did that, I chose Nebraska because it, it met a lot of the things I was looking for. And prim primary thing I was looking for was a department that knew what they were good at and wanted to get better and had a plan. And I thought, that's what I want to be part of because that's the way I do things. I'm very goal oriented. So I wanted to be part of that. And so I went to Nebraska, and I've been there 20 years now. So the first 10 years, just as a professor, doing my job, building up my, my research program, getting my name established in my discipline, doing a lot of interdisciplinary activity. That was my focus. No idea what the vice chancellor for research did that whole time. I was assistant professor, my head's in the lab. I, I'm just doing my stuff. So uh, that, was, that was good. And then I was, I, one of the things I had done was help build uh, a national um, research program called Cyber Physical Systems. And so I was one of the leaders organizing that, building the community around it, demonstrating that there was a need for this area. And I was on, I negotiating, I was on my way to be the, the, the inaugural program officer at the National Science Foundation for Cyber Physical Systems. And, excuse me. Uh, so I was uh, on my way to do that when the department needed a new department chair. And I was interested in doing that too. Timing wasn't right, but I did that. I, so I was a department chair for five years, had a lot of success there. Uh, I was being evaluated, reappointment. I was our dean of College of Arts and Sciences, stepped down. And I, my tenure home is in the College of Engineering. My department, Computer Science and Engineering, is in both the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of Engineering. And we go for tenure and promotion through both colleges. That's another longer story that I can share. Um, so I served as the interim dean for the College of Arts and Sciences uh, for a year. My plan was to come back to the department. Along the way, I decided uh, to go into the, to the research office. Our, our vice chancellor for research at the time was, uh, had a recurrence of bladder cancer, and it was pretty quiet. Most people didn't know about it. But he and the, our, uh, we called a, our provost, the senior vice chancellor for academic affairs, convinced me that I should go in there and help provide some continuity and stability. And so I thought, OK, I'll do that. I don't know what they do anyway, but I'll go in and do that. It was a great experience. And that's really, in the end, why I'm here now, having done that, been the institutional official for all the things, the go-to-jail person for the institution if you don't, aren't compliant with export control, you know, human research participants, animal research participants, uh, the conflict of interest, the research integrity, uh, in charge of all of that, and research development. So it was a great experience. And then uh, our vice chancellor did step down, passed away shortly after that, and I was asked to serve in the interim role. So these experiences, and, and, and especially as the, the, the dean being in the College of Arts and Sciences, was great to learn the real value and, and the slight that our, so, our uh, humanists and our social scientists uh, researchers feel all the time. Because our research office always talked about the money. What's the money? Show me the money. I want more money, right? Well, you only need so much money if you're doing research in, in philosophy, right, or in English. So that influenced me a lot and, and, and 
shaped my ideas. The money is a trailing indicator of our success, of the excellent work we're doing. And so I think we should be focusing on the, on the front side of these things. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I want to help UIC bring things to the next level, just like I did with my department. I wanted to, they had a mission. I looked when I was first contacted uh, by, this, by this rule by Jeff Harris. I was like, I'm not really sure. I'm happy where I am. I like Lincoln, and, and everything's good. My youngest is graduating from high school this year, and I kind of like to be around for another year while he gets shoveled up, you know, settled in somewhere, and, and then I'll look around. Uh, and he was telling me all the good things happening here, and I went, yeah, I know. This is a sales pitch. I get it. Uh, and then, and I kind of, and then Pete called me up, and uh, and gave me a, a more detailed story. And I'm like, okay, this is the dean. This is the dean talking. This is this is serious. He's talking about things that I like to hear and is interested. In. So I, I I said, oh, okay, let me look at it. I'll I'll, I'll look. Around. And as I started looking, I was impressed. Right? It was it it was much more than I thought. And so uh, I excel at strategic thinking. I'm very goal oriented with a focus on excellence, as I mentioned. So I'm looking to see can I bring these skills? Is that what's needed here? Is there a fit? Will these skills help you? And I want to find out, is UIC ready to move to the next level of research productivity and recognition? Mm -hmm. That's what, what I think there's huge opportunities here. This is, this is a, you probably already know this, but sometimes you, you get, in the day-to-day -day stuff, you get sucked into it. This is a tremendous university. You've got a lot of things going really well here. So um, where are we now? Well, first of all, this is a great location. It's a tremendous urban campus. We're, we're, we're really poised for some success. Um, you're in, you have an incredibly rich uh, with talented faculty across the board, right? Not just the people on the search committee. Those, of course, are talented and stuff. But you've got many other talented faculty here. And it's, it could go on and on, right? So there's, there are things you're doing well here. I don't think it's, that story is told as much as I uh, think it could be. I don't think it's as visible as perhaps it could be. But that's, a, that's an important starting point. If you've got talented faculty, then you bring talented students. And you can start to do something. The faculty are here because students come here. Students come here because faculty are going to be here. They learn. It's a symbiotic relationship there. And we've got to build on that. And so we've got a wonderful, diverse student body here. And it's growing. And this is actually a tremendous opportunity for us. And I'm sure you know this, right? This is, this is really, really amazing. And the location in the city, we've got a natural laboratory right here in the city. There are things that you're working on across the spectrum that can, we can tackle if we come together across the disciplines we can tackle societal challenges that naturally can be evaluated right here in the city. And they'll have national consequences. To me, that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, so where are we? I think UIC is flying under the radar. All the pieces are, are there. We're poised to emerge as the research university in Chicago. Okay. And then that, to me, is one measure of success. Now I'm going to focus on research. But when I talk about research, it, you can't do research alone. You've got to integrate all the parts so that we're all going the same part. So it's also the academics, right? our curriculum. We've got to bring these things together so we're moving in the same direction and, and take advantage of the strengths that we have here, which means what's ahead. I think tremendous opportunities, of course, challenges. The challenges we know and we can get caught up on the challenges and it can wear us down. We think about scarce resources. It's the funding agencies up until this last budget were continually to be flat or cutting, right, from, for, in terms of research uh, funding agencies. We got a big boost this time, but it's a one-time shot. Busted the budget, tax cut, the big expanding. It's not going to happen again next year. It, we're, there's going to be a day of reckoning for these things. So we need a plan that's going to bring us past that. Those are challenges. Well, that's OK. Turns out those challenges, I believe, match up with things that we need to address anyway. So here on our campus, we've, we've got 
tremendous amount of funding from NIH. Huge, huge portion of our funding. Not as much from some of the other agencies. So we need to increase that. It turns out, I, from what I can tell, I'll know more when I, if I talk more faculty, we're getting a lot of money for research from the same agency over and over again, where there are multiple agencies that would fund that research or a variation of it. So we start thinking about programs and the impact of those programs and not the project. We can diversify our funding portfolio. We can get more money from more agencies and increase the likelihood of getting funding and go to another level. We also need to be thinking about uh, what are we going to be really great at? And this is the tough decisions. This is a part that is very hard for faculty and administrations is to say, we're good right now. We're good at a lot of things. Don't you agree? Right? You recognize that? What are you great at? I think you're probably great at some things, but I couldn't find them. That's why I say it's flying under the radar here a little bit. I we want to be great. We want that when people talk about an area, they know it's us. It's here. And we're great at that. We're recognized. And you can't be great at everything. No university can be. There's too much to cover. You can be good at a lot of things. I want to, I want to help a university become great at some things. What are they? We have to build off of our strengths. So these are the tough decisions. What are we going to be great at? How are we going to get there? We have to prioritize those investments. But, but that doesn't mean someone else loses. We'll all benefit from this. And we can't, we're going to fund something to the exclusion of other things. We still have to fund and be good at everything that we're doing. We're still a comprehensive R1 university in, in an urban setting. We've got to be good at all these. So how do we get there? I like to focus, and, and it's a foundation for everything, is excellence. And we have to focus on the excellence and the impact of what we're trying to do. So, we often talk about the dollars, and I did earlier too. We talked about the, the, the strength of our program, we measure it by the dollars. The, the funding that we get is a trailing indicator of our success. You have to already be doing excellent work and have a vision to get that money to do that research. And then you have to deliver on it if you're going to get more funding, follow on, OK? But we focus on excellence. We decide what we're going to do. And then we have to be able to communicate the impact of that work. As a, as a faculty member, as a researcher, you should be able to explain, I think, the impact of your research that you're doing to everyone you meet on your way to and from work. Every person that you meet, when you stop at gas, you go to the grocery store, and they say, what do you do? And you say, I work in this. Well, what does that mean? And explain how that's going to change their life. Maybe not this year or next year, but it enables something that eventually will change their life. And you can understand how that's going to be. And that's for all of us, whether you're a philosophy major, an English or professor, an English professor, an engineer, or in the health sciences. In some areas, it's, it's a little bit easier. If you're doing translational activities, it's a little bit easier than if you're doing the basic research. But we should all be thinking about how to do that. And, and I think that's the starting point, is, is to focus on that. And, and now we can start to recognize everyone's excellence and the impact that people are doing. And that brings us together as a community. And we're not just saying, well, you got this much money, this much. Everyone, I think everyone has an obligation, a, a goal, not an obligation. It's too strong. I would like to have everyone have the goal that, that they want to fund their research program. Think about that for a minute. Are you going to be able to do that? I couldn't. I was really good at getting research money. And I had a large program, but I didn't fund the entire thing. I was still getting my salary, a big chunk of my salary from the state. I wasn't funding all of that. Everything else I was funding, right? I wasn't paying, but I wasn't paying all my utilities. I wasn't paying everything else. So, but if, I'm, if the goal is that now, the success is if I'm, if I'm in, in the humanities, for example, I don't need as much money to do my, my research, my scholar activity, as if, if I'm in engineering. If I'm in fine and for, fine and performing arts, I need different types of resources and I don't need as much in a continual basis. It's a different need. But if my goal is to think I want to try and get funding for my research, there are sources for all of this kind of funding. And we start to get money to, to help with it. What does that do? 
enables us to do things that we couldn't do before. It frees up resources that we might be investing to do that research that we can reinvest to go to another level. And so I think that's part of where we want to focus on this. And, and then, what, then what we can do once we, we're thinking that way is I want to see us, and these are, these are three simple words, you've probably seen this before, dream bigger, act bolder, and be better. Right? Pretty simple, right? But I see, for example, we'll pick at NIH, right? We've got some P50 grants. We've got some center grants. I didn't see, maybe, maybe I apologize if I missed them, uh, I didn't see an engineering research center. I didn't see a science and technology center. There are opportunities, I think, if we start to bring disciplines together, we've got all the pieces, that we want to go to a really big level of funding, a really big center. Now that takes commitment on the faculty, we've got to resource them, we've got, but we start to dream bigger. What is it we want to do? What's the big challenge we want to address societally? And we've got some right here. Right? Social inequities, right? In, in education, health, health care, right? Health, health, minority health disparities. We can go through, and, and that's, those are things that we can attack from all across campus, just as one area. We've, I, I saw in the research, uh, Office of Research, Vice uh, Chancellor for Research, there were six areas that we identified as strengths. Some of those are stronger than others, I think, and some I don't know what they really mean. Um, brain was, was one, and I don't know what that really means, but around there, I, I think that means we've got some really good strength in that. What about the brain would we tackle? Can we be more specific and tackle a, a more, something a little bit more general and come together with a, a number of different disciplines? Something really big. And one thing, when you, you dream bigger, we need to act bolder. We need to say, we're gonna solve that problem. We're doing this. Now you're on the hook, publicly. How are we going to follow through? And when you do, you're going to be better. And you're going to be known for it. You're going to, get, you're going to be recognized as, this is the place that's working on this. We, don't, we want to build on the things that we're, we're already good at. So we want to lead with our strengths. We've got some research strengths. Our location, right? I've talked about the research strengths already. And, and I don't come here trying to tell you what your strengths are. I'm telling you what I saw, and I couldn't see everything on the website. I can look at some numbers and I can think, but I don't know who wants to lead. You have to have people willing to lead at the faculty level these things, or it doesn't happen. Just because I say, we want to be great here, means nothing. We can have a great plan, but if we don't have the leaders and the faculty leading that thing, it's not going to happen. And, and the staff has to be on board, and all of us as a community agree. We've got to have commitments from the deans and the provost. It's not just the research office. I can do nothing by myself. It's all about the relationships that we're going to build. We're going to, the Office of the Research has two tools, I, I frequently say. Uh, we have the power of pers persuasion, right, and the power of the purse. Faculty don't report to my office. I can't, I can't do anything to them if they behave badly, uh, except maybe shut down their lab because there's not non-compliance. We don't want to do that. But, you know, so I want to convince them that we should be doing this. I've got to form partnerships with the deans, with the provost, with the chancellor. And we have to have a vision that people get behind. And then they have to be willing to lead. And then the purse, we've got to find the resources to make that happen. We never have an, you never start with the money and say, oh, I want to do something great. How much money do I have? All the money you have is, if you're like most universities, it's all spent, it's all committed. So you have to first say, what is it we want to do? Why is it important? How are we going to measure that success? What's our plan? How are we going to measure it? How much is, what are the resources it's going to take? And then we have to find the resources. And that's where the tough decisions come from. But we want to lead with our strengths. Our location is one huge strength. Being here in the city, you've got all kinds of companies already here and moving here that want to f get a lever leverage, uh, leg up and leverage the university. We've got to build those relationships. We have to do it in a way that as with all relationships, everyone in the relationship has to get benefit, see the benefit from the relationship. We want to manage those expectations. What does a company want from a partner? If we're going to have a strategic partnership with a company, what do they want? I can tell you some things that we know for sure they're going to want, right? What do we want from them? And is it going to be something that we can work together to jointly achieve something where we both our needs are being met? And we can think about it with the, with the city, with the companies, with the state, uh, a partnership between them. I, I'm doing that now with the city of Lincoln. 
and some companies in, in uh, Lincoln and the state and the university and created an interlocal agency. It's a, it's a, it's a, I thought it was called a joint public agency, but I realized I didn't want to tax anything. So it becomes a, I always call it joint agency, but interlocal is, a, is the term. Um, but it's a, a, an agreement that we reach into and it has a management and a board of directors and, and guiding things. But now we can both invest and leverage the, the resources that we're putting in there. We have a common goal. We've got to build those kinds of partnerships. And the diversity that we have here with our, with our community, with our students, is a tremendous opportunity for us. And we need to, we need to lead with that strength. You're a minority, we are a minority serving institute here. That, of course, has its own challenges because a lot of, we, a lot of times we have, we have first generation students that, that don't have the, the social and economic background that will help them succeed and we need to help them be successful. But we also have vast perspectives and a different way of looking at the world that can help and inform our research that we're doing. And we can, there are challenges in the city that we can start to address and, and work with, with that diversity and leverage it. And it's a tremendous asset for us. And so these, I think, are our clear strengths. We need to lead with those. We don't have to worry about what we're not. We go to partner with, with other institutions. We're going to bring some clear strengths. And, and that's what we need to focus on and, and bring value and get something in return in that partnership. So another thing, I said we're flying under the radar. Uh, another thing that I would like to see to address that is we need to let people know more about what we're doing and what we're good at. So I would say we need more public intellectuals. You have some, but a public intellectual is someone that's uh, very skilled, very knowledgeable in their discipline, and they're able to communicate that knowledge to the public and to share that knowledge and interpret things. So a public intellectual is someone who's going to be interviewed by the national public radio, by the local TV stations, the national TV stations. They want to know, how to, what does this mean for us? What's the, what's, what's the impact of this policy change? Come to us. Someone will take that role and do it. So that means we need, we need researchers, usually they're faculty, who have the core ability to do this, the interest to be further trained, because most of us aren't natural at doing that, right? It's still something I'm working on a lot to try and do that. And, and then be recognized and, re, and rewarded for taking the time it does to go away from, pull away from their regular research activities. But they're gonna be our public face, explaining the impact of what we're doing and what we're great at. And that's, that's a program that we could create of public intellectuals. And they could be asked to write articles, opinion pieces, talking on the radio, things like that. Um, but in the end, what we're going to have to do, how do we get there? We have to set to strategic goals and measure our progress. If we don't measure where we're going, we won't know if we're there. We won't know if we're investing in the right areas. And, and we've got to know what we're expecting. What are the milestones we're going to have? And, and if we're not there, why? It might be perfectly valid reason why we didn't get to where we thought we were. We shifted goals, but we should have a plan. We've got a nice strategic priority for the campus we've set up. And now we need, and you, may, you probably have some of this, right? I, I don't, a lot of, the, I should say this at the beginning. A lot of what I'm gonna tell you is no secret sauce. You probably have these pieces already. And in fact, I know you do in some cases. But this, is, we've gotta all get behind it, right? I can't tell you this is the goal, follow me and we'll be great. Because I'll go down that path and I'll turn around, there'll be no one behind me. And they go, well, that's your plan. Right? We, it has to be a community. We've got to set it. We've got to get input from everyone and agree that, we're, that we're, we're want to, we're want to achieve this. That's, that's a process. So as I mentioned, you, you have strategic priorities already. Student experience and success. I would like, I, that's, that's why we're here, right? We want that to happen. I think it needs to be integrated into everything we do. So the research enterprise should include student experiences and success. And there's funding available to, to bring that in. Now, I'm talking about both undergraduate and graduate students. So undergraduate students, after their first year, their second and third year, they're not so skilled, they're not experienced yet. But if we want to make a difference, we want to better prepare them and have a unique differentiated experience, we start to bring them into the research program. It's going to influence what we do. And we've got to make time to mentor them properly. 
and they're funding opportunities, but we've got to want to do that. And, and not all faculty will want to do that. Not all faculty want to, want to have a high profile research career either. And, and what we want to do is leverage the strength of everyone. Everyone has a role to play. Some of us are really gifted teachers, and we should respect and value that. Some are, are very talented researchers, and others, their passion is mentoring young, young students, young people. And maybe it overlaps with some of these things. But let's, let's take and recognize the strength of these people and integrate them. I, I'm, sometimes I'll talk about I'm kind of lazy. Whatever I do, I want to get returns in multiple ways. I want, I want that to count for three goals if I can, rather than just one. That way, everything I do has a purpose and I'm getting multiple benefits from doing that. And, and that, to me, is the, the best. Uh, works well for me. And I, and I think it's useful for an organization to think that way as well. Uh, national, international impact and visibility. This is what I was talking about, that we need to be, need to be moving in this direction. Uh, and the Chicago and community engagement, this is our location. We want to be building right on top of this. This is, this is the, we've got a test bed, a laboratory right here. We can evaluate these things and how, how we're doing. And I think it's really important. And then, of course, we want, you want to be an entrepreneurial university. We, need to, we want to go to another level. This is a, not the way you're thinking about entrepreneurial, but you can't just keep doing more of what you're doing. How many people here are not working as hard as they think they should? How many? No one's raising their hand. They don't want to be caught off guard and say, oh, I could work harder. No, we're all working very hard. All right, faculty are hardworking people. So how are you going to go to another level? Are you going to work harder? Nonsense. Processes that we do at one level don't always work to go to another level. You have to go and reimagine and redefine, recreate the process that you're going to do. We have to entrepreneurial in the way we do our regular activities. And so that's why I always ask, why do we do this? Is this helping us get to where we want to go? Not, we've always done it that way isn't a good answer. It's one we often get. That's the way we always do it. That's not good. That means we'll always do what we've always done. And if we want to aspire to something more, we have to do it differently. I don't know what that is here. And it might be some of what we do is great, and we won't change that. But we need to be asking those questions. So we need to be entrepreneurial in the way we look at everything, from getting our funding to the way we train people, train our educate our students, to the way we get funding, to even our process that we do in our day-to-day -day operations. And that all gets folded in together. That's why I don't think you separate these missions of the university. They're, they're integrated. We've got to bring them together. I've got to have, if I'm here as your vice chancellor of research, I've got to have good relations with everyone. Everyone. The faculty the deans, the provosts, the chancellor, the staff. Right? You guys are all smart enough. If the staff isn't on your side, you're going nowhere. Right? They, they've got to be, they're there. They're doing all the things they did, making things happen for us. That's what we have to be doing. So how do we know? I, th I think I'm close to out of time here. So how do we know when we're, when we're, we've, we're here, when we're, we're there? Right? How are we going to measure that? I have very simple criteria, because I don't like to make it too complicated when NPR is contacting our faculty for expert opinions. Not just locally, but you know, all things considered, and the national. I, I turn on my way to, the, on, to work and driving, turn on NPR, and, and I hear our faculty explaining the impact of a policy or, or in a research project. And that happens every week. I'm like, whew, that's good. We, we've, we're, we're, people are paying attention to us. We're having an impact. And people know about the impact that we're doing. We're emerging. When people reference research in Chicago, they mean us. After hearing about the, a little bit of competition with Champaign-Urbana, maybe I should say when they talk about research in Illinois, they mean us. Right? We are not going to do and compete at the things those other institutions are already strong at um, any more than we are. We, we have our own strengths, and we need to merge and leverage that and focus on what we do really well and be recognized for that, embrace that. That's, that's the real opportunity that we have. I don't, I don't believe in trying to grow everything and, and compete on every front, because I think you can't be good at anything then when you're trying to do too much. So those are the tough choices that I have. And uh, that's all I had for today. I wanted to give you time for questions. And how did I do on my time? You did perfect. OK, great. Yeah, thanks. You're Thank you very much. I appreciate that presentation. Um, and do we have questions in the audience? Uh, yeah,
Go ahead. Yep. Oh, as I move around, okay? Oh, All right, excuse me. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Uh, use the microphone, please. I guess we, I, I forgot to welcome those that are on, on the uh, video remotely, and I apologize for not including some of the remote sites, but uh, I, I understand right. the microphone. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. I'm Glenn Schumacher. I'm the dean of the College of Pharmacy. Okay. Um, I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of your experience in clinical or health-related research since your background is engineering. And yeah. I don't really know much about Nebraska, but I, I know that the health campus is in Omaha. I don't know if that's part of your purview. Right. That's, that's a really important question for a campus like this. Um, so let me tell you uh, that the, I'm not a biomedical researcher. Right? I've done biomedical research. I've, I've participated in surgeries uh, in comparative medicine with, with uh, uh, terminal and non-terminal surgeries with, with pigs on, on uh, um, uh, surgical robots, but that's not my primary area. Uh, and, and I've been responsible for animal care program, things like that. Our campus for a medical school is a separate entire institution in our system, completely. They report all on their own, you know, and they're in Omaha. Depending on how you, where you measure from, it's somewhere between 45 and 60 miles away from, in, from our campus. I think it's like 48. But uh, um, we're, we're separate from that. Now, that's uh, an administrative structure that hurts us. So one of the things I've spent a lot of time doing is trying to bridge that gap because our medical school will do much better with more engineering and science input and they've got health sciences in there so they they don't need as much our some of our social and behavioral sciences although there's some areas that we can we can help with but they need the engineering and the science for sure um, so i've done a number of niches jointly our science engineering and medicine initiative jointly with the vice chancellor for research at the, the medical school where we're trying to create these interdisciplinary activities and and knowing okay what's the funding now those most of those projects are going to get nih funding right um, but this is where I, I've seen, we've I've identified many of those where we will, we bring them together. I, don't, I won't go into too much detail. There's activities we do, we bring people together and then we feed seed, seed uh, research projects afterwards. And uh, the thing that we give, if many of those projects I discover, of course the, the uh, medical researchers, they're all focused on NIH funding, right? They should be and we want them to be. There's a lot of value in, for our campus in getting NIH funding. But we also found that many of those projects, we can get funding from, for them from the National Science Foundation, from the Department of Defense, and two other areas that have overlap if they look more broadly at the program that they're doing, not the project per se, the specific aims. Um, so, um, but we have, we have um, NIH, we're, we're an idea state, so we've got three COBRAs that have been active for various three. We've got one that rolled off uh, two years ago, another one rolling off this next year, and we've got a third one. I'm pretty sure we'll get, we right now have three. One will fall off, and we can only have three as an institution. I'm sure we'll, we'll have another one that I think will be now uh, funded this year, so we'll have another three, and that'll be at our max. Um, we were right on the bubble on our score, and uh, talked to Fred Taylor, the program manager at NIH. I went and visited him, and he said, well, you know, if we get this bump up in funding, you'll probably get funded, and if not, probably not. Well, we got a bump up greater than what he wanted. Uh, what he was asking for. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to get that funded. But we, we took a mitigating circumstance. We also resubmitted, and we, were, we talked to the program manager. We could resubmit until a funding decision was made, and then we had to withdraw if we got funded, of course. So uh, I, I don't have, uh, um, we have NIH funding. We have biomedical research and our engineer, and we're partnering with the medical school, and, and that's my area of focus. But we have, we're ALAC accredited for our animal care program, as is our medical school, and, and we're AHARP accredited, which is now what our medical school is for their ARB and, and things like that. So it, it's, it, we've got to make sure we're doing well on that front, obviously. Yes, sir. Could we get the microphone to you? Oh, and by the way, on the, on the NIH. <coughs> thank you, thank you for this your presentation. <coughs> <coughs> <There. coughs> I got so excited. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are there are seed programs like an R25 <coughs> that we can get money to train to do these interdisciplinary activities. We can get up to I think it's a hundred thousand dollars a year for three to five years to just start to see these activities from the NIH. We can get it also from NSF. So we want to try and pull the right sources to find the resources to do the activity that we need to do. So it's important, that's why I always think we want to look at not just at NIH, but all these other agencies as well. We already do really, really well here in NIH. It's sort of flattened out for a while, but we, we can do better, I think, and then we need to build up the other areas. 
Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Michael Shelkov, and I'm a doctorate student, uh, doctor of nursing practice. I'm going to start soon. Uh, my question, I really like the concept that you mentioned about the social uh, intellectuals. So that's a perfect concept. And then from my personal experience going through UIC, you know, I communicated with a lot of researchers, with a lot of, a lot of prominent international minds. And so my question, how do we retain that force? Because a lot of times, maybe you have some, some of the uh, suggestions suggestions on initiatives and some of the greatest challenges that from what our discussions at the University at UIC were build on inconsistencies inconsistencies in the processes for research or for like not following up on expectations going to the labs and then some of my international friends they left back to Germany or even here nation nationwide because I never really we never discussed money because funding was here but just the structural inconsistencies and not being able to follow up on them so what would you suggest like you know building real dyads or interpreferential dyads or how would you approach that so inconsistencies between the European inconsistencies agencies, in the, in the, like the the processes were changing quite fast and then they're working on certain research and then that we were not able to follow up or not able to you know fulfill those expectations and that was a frustration okay um, i'm not sure i fully understand the, the question but um managing expectations is is really like administratively really maybe or structurally yeah. we can approach it how i don't know if so uh, let me let me focus it from. I think there's a lot of dynamics that you just introduced. So let me just talk about between, collaborating between new institutions in the in the U.S. When you talk about institutions in Europe, it's a whole other ball game because of the funding mechanisms, the some of the other rules and things like that. But if the if the process was changing internally to us and inconsistent between us, that's something that that's that's something we have to have predictable and working on a regular basis, and we have to know what that is. And part of that is is making sure that they're set in, in the right and fully compliant but not overly compliant all right and and we all know what that means okay and the, and we has to be predictable we have to you have to know what to expect and we deliver what we expect we're a service organization as a, as a research office and it has to, we're there to remove the barriers for you right so first i don't understand more specifics what are the real challenges you have and then we we tackle those one at a time but then we make clear what what our what we do and why we do it and that is usually pretty, pretty easily to match to another U.S. institution. Doing it with a European institution is a little bit more challenging, but we can still do that. We just have to first understand what we do and why. Um, and I'd want to get to more detail about what the challenge you had that, that was inconsistent, because that should never happen. Inconsistency usually means you didn't understand why something was done or the rules were changed on you when you're going. And we need to see why that happened, if it wasn't forced or not. But, but that's something we'd, we'd want to do. We'd, and I always ask the faculty member, what is your issue? I talk with our, our team. Why, what do they think it means? And usually the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? Because everyone has a view of it, a perception. And then we figure out, OK, the goal is to re, just to address that problem, that challenge. Let's remove it. Everyone agrees on that. Then, then, it's, then it's easier to move forward. But, but we shouldn't, that shouldn't be a problem for you. I'm, I'm sorry that it was. It shouldn't be. Um, so I think one another question we got received online. Could you, could you talk about your process of helping to ensure? You know, one of the things about the office is there. We need to make sure that the trains are running on time and sure. all that. So talk a little bit about sort of how you would manage that, how you would help set expectations, um, and, and how you would sort of help to support the research environment at UAC. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the first level of what we have to do, right? Things have to work. The trains have, usually for, the trains have to run on time. So uh, is, is that something I'm going to spend all my time doing? Boy, I hope not, uh, because I'll never be successful, even by myself doing it. We've got to have a team that all understands what that means. We're, we're here to remove these obstacles. What are the guidelines? What are the, the, the rails that we have to stay in between? What's the, the goal? Everyone has a role, they understand it. I delegate, I don't micromanage. So I say, okay, you're in charge of this. This is the goal, come up with a plan. Tell me what that plan is, why it's the right plan, what resources we need, and now you make it happen. And if you run into a problem that you can't resolve, then let me know about it. If there's a, if there's, I don't wanna be surprised, right? If there's an issue, better let me know about it so I can then let the chancellor know about it and the provost know about it, you know, and anyone else that might need to know. 
Um, but we try and delegate that, and it has to work. But the clear expectations. I always tell my, tell my staff, in the delegate, all the good news that happens, good things, you tell the faculty and you get credit for it. When it's bad news, I take the blame. Blame me. You've got the, our, our staff and, and team have to interact with the faculty all the time, and sometimes they, they don't get to give them good news. Well, they've got a day-to-day -day relationship. I tell them that, blame me. I tell them, you, you really fought hard, with, and you tried to convince Steve, but the vice chancellor just wouldn't go for it. And so, but he's happy to meet with you if you want to resolve it, to talk about it. And, and then that way, they're not the bearer of the bad news. I get the blame, and that's okay. That's my job. So that's how you, you, you get these things going. But you have to listen to people. When, when things aren't working right, we need to know what is it. And then we'll, we'll find out different views of it. It's usually around I or B's are a common one, right? Those are always a challenge. Um, it's never so simple. So, and, and, but there are commonalities, things that happen. But, we, we, and, but you have metrics. So I have regular metrics that I use you know, with the, uh, what's the time that we take to process protocols? How many protocols are we doing? What are the times we have to send them back because they weren't completed correctly by the PI to begin with? And, and that can indicate whether we have an educational problem. You know, if we have a new area, we have problems. So we've got metrics in different areas. We measure it, and they give annual or monthly reports on their metrics. And we try to see, can we do better if we're falling behind? Why? Um, and then if I get, we get complaints from faculty, we, we see what that's about. I don't jump on people and say, oh, the faculty said this. It must be, must be true. It's their truth, and we've got to figure out why that happened and remove, resolve it. But, but that's all part of it. Uh, Pete. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I keep moving up to talk with you, and, and Jeff wants me in the camera here. I'm sorry for all those that are streaming and watching online. Given the wide range of research and scholarly activities we have here at UIC, how would you, um, if you were to be the VCR, uh, gain knowledge of many different diverse areas, you know, including areas that uh, are new areas for you or a little bit more of a stretch? Right. Uh, so one of the things I learned, first learned when I was the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and it was reinforced uh, when in my role in the Vice, in the vice Chancellor's office, uh, I am constantly amazed. I've learned something new every day and amazed by the faculty and the research that's being done. It's quite humbling, actually. Um, but I realized shortly that I, I don't have the mental capacity to learn the details of all of these things. I can learn a few points about it, and, but I need experts around that, that are trained in that area, and I need to rely on them, and so we have partnerships, it's relationships. And I, need to be, I can recognize excellence in many cases, but there's others where we get experts to come in and help. Either we have them on campus. When I do internal competitions, for example, we need to have limited submission activities. I recruit experts to help evaluate those, those roles because I'm not qualified to do that. Um, I get input from other experts, and then we talk with the team, and we say, okay, this is what we're going to go forward. And so I rely on the input from many others, because I can't be the expert on everything. It takes a team approach, and we, we have to bring in people that are more qualified than I am at, at times. Um, but we, we, together, we can cover all of it. But I, I haven't met anyone yet that's really an expert, can, can do all of it themselves. Um, at least not well. Some people think they can do it, maybe, but I, I, I certainly can't. I, I've learned that I can't right away. Is that, is that get to what you're getting at, asking? So one of the other things you, you mentioned is um, we can't do everything, and we sort of have to prioritize sort of where we're going to go if we're going to get to the next level. Can you talk a little bit about the process that you would go through to sort of help us figure out what are those few things that we, we would end up doing? Yeah. I, I would want us to, uh, and I assume you've done some of these activities already as part of strategic planning, but I would like to have a, a, a task force. It's going to be a community process. We have to go through a process where we're going to identify, and we can, we can do first order approximation. We know we're strong in these areas based on rankings, funding, and, and reputational things. So these are candidates. And then we have to get, have some people that do some visioning about and tie that with what are, what are societal challenges that have been recognized by National Academy of Sciences and engineering and various funding agencies. We can look at the budgets for funding agencies over the next five years. That's where they're going to be interested. And is there, there's, is there an intersection of what we're good at where there are opportunities and societal challenges that we can start to frame and come around? And, and we'll propose some things and have some public forums and get input from people, I believe. It has to be a community event. We have to brainstorm and think, 
how how do people in different disciplines contribute to this this thing and help to sell that vision to them and it's a community process and then we will try and we'll see some things emerge that that make sense we'll include the faculty uh and the and the deans uh, for sure and the, the chancellor and, and the provost and probably students i think would probably be important but um it's not something that i'm going to be able to just say and i don't think you just to go by numbers in certain area it's just got to be something we all agree on and and we can we can usually what happens is you 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 won't find here's number one and here's number two here's number three these are these are three areas that we can we can all agree are important because we can all see our role in one of those areas anyway um other questions okay all right, then. I think, uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Again, remind people to, yes. Good. And again, remind people to go to the website and do the evaluations. There was a reception and some very nice refreshments in the back, so people have an opportunity to sort of interact more directly with you. Thank you so much.